Our first reading this morning comes from Ruth chapter 1, it's verses 15 to 18. Luke said, Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. And then following on Ruth chapter two, one to 13. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow after a all along after the women. I have not. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you, and wherever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked them, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. Brief introduction to our to to Ruth this morning, and um, I have to say, hands up if you if you want to answer. Right. So, <laughs> tell me, was last week's story a happy story? Hands up. Well, hands up if you think it was a happy story. Right. See, boys and girls, no hands up. Right. That's bad. Hands up if you think it was a really, really sad story. Right, okay, it's a really, really sad story because it's a story about, it's a story about a family, mom and dad, two boys, who go to another country because there is no food to eat where they are. There's no harvest. And so they go to this other country called Moab and sadly, the dad dies. But the two boys get married. And after about 10 years, they die as well. So there are three women now in the household, and all of them have lost their husbands. What a tragedy. And Naomi, who's the mother in law, she says, We're going back to Bethlehem, where, we, where I came from. Okay, so David, if you would like to put up on the screen the introduction, there we are. We're going to look briefly at what has already been read to us and what will be read to us, just some things that are important for understanding the story. And we're going to begin with the idea of gleaning. Hands up if you know what this painting is called. 
Jean. It is the cleaners. Do you know who um, painted it? Mealy. Do you know where it hangs? It is in France. It's in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. I've actually seen it. And I've got a print of it in my office where, where the books on Ruth are because it's brilliant. And it's a painting that just speaks the story of Ruth to us because do you see, do you see what they're doing? Can, can you see what they're doing, boys and girls? Do you hands up if you are they? Anybody? Grant. Yes, but do you see what they've got in their hands? They're picking up the leftovers from the sheaves because that is what gleaning is all about. They, they go behind the harvesters and they pick up little ears of corn or wheat or whatever. And, and that is what gleaning is. Now, how does it work? Well, you're not allowed just to go into a field of wheat or corn and do this. It has to be after the harvesters have been there. And in the Bible, the harvesters were told, don't go right to the edge of the field, leave some there for the cleaners. And if you gather all your corn or wheat together and put it into a sheaf and you drop some, don't pick it up, leave that for the cleaners. So that's how it worked, but why does it exist? Anybody want to hazard a guess at why it existed? Susan? Because there were poor people who had no food. Gleaning, if you like, was an ancient equivalent of a food bank. This is where people got their food who were really very poor. So we've got this. If we're looking for heroes and heroines in the story of Ruth, this is the heroine. We'll come to the hero later on. Her, the meaning of her name is refresh or comfort, and, and that's what she was to, to Malon, who was her late husband. And, uh, but you see what she was? She was a Moabite, and she calls herself a foreigner to Boaz. So if she was a foreigner in this place called Bethlehem, who is going to help her? That's the question. Who is going to help her? And if you could move the uh, camera um, up a wee bit, we'll be able to see if she was a widow, a widow of three in the same family, who would want to marry her now? Now, the people in these days were very, very suspicious. If you had one death in the family, that was one thing. If you had three deaths in the family, and that was another thing, then it looked as if there would be a curse upon your family. Who would want to marry into a family that was cursed? So these three widows were together. And in those days, there was no um, benefit system. Either the family helped them, they helped themselves, or they had to rely on the kindness of others. There was a real social and economic plight. And, and the question really at the beginning of the book of Ruth is, how is this great problem that these three women are facing going to be resolved? How is the story going to be told that will bring a happy ending rather than a sad ending? On the way back to Bethlehem, these three women had to come to a decision. As they were walking, Naomi was saying to herself, look, if I take these two girls, and, and they would only be probably in their mid-twenties, if I take these two girls back to Bethlehem, what life is there for them there? They're foreigners. They, they're Moabites. They, you know, they, they, what life would there be for them? They should just go back home and, and reestablish a family life there. And that's what she said to them. And they cried and they cried and they cried. And Orpah, one of them, decided, I'm going to go back home. But Ruth said that she was going to commit herself to Naomi and face the challenges together. We'll see later how that worked out for her. So these two widows together decided that they would seek to resolve the plight staying together 
despite the struggle that it would be. And the other person in the story that we're going to be thinking of is a man, the hero of the story, a man called Boaz. Now, this story, if you read this story carefully from beginning to end, you will find that most of the story itself is told in conversation. People talking to one another. And only on certain occasions does the narrator interfere in the story. And this is one of the, one of the points. Right at the beginning of chapter 2, the narrator tells us something that's very important. That Naomi had a, a near relative on the side of Elimelech, um, a man by the name of Boaz. He was what, he, what would be called in those days a redeemer. That is, if, if a family had to sell their land because they were really poor, in order to get that land back from the person that they'd sold it to out the, of the family, someone else within the family would buy that land back for them at a certain point. So that person who bought the land back was called a redeemer. Uh, any, anybody old enough to remember um, pawn shops? Come on, admit it, admit it, right. So uh, what, uh, what's a pawn shop? Right, so it's somewhere where you can take things and get money for them. You're, you're needing money and you've got no cash, so you take a precious thing, you give it to the pawn shop, it's like, a, it's like a loan, only you have to repay the loan. And when you go back to repay the loan, that is called a redemption. Yes, a redemption. That is bought. And that's what redeemer means. Boaz was the family redeemer. So we're going to be thinking in the second act of the book of Ruth, who am I? And where do I belong? This is Ruth thinking, who am I and where do I belong? And I'll pass control back to David for Emily to come and read the second part of the story. This reading is Ruth 2, verses 14 to 23. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here. Have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead, she added. That man is our close relative. He is one of the guardian redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Thank you, Emily. Amen, and thanks be to God for his word. So as we come to our brief reflection, let's pray together. Open our eyes, O Lord, that we may see the wonderful truths contained in your word. Amen. I'm just remembering that there was something that John usually says at, at the beginning of the service, and that is, if, if you have a youngster that you feel needs a bit of a break, 
then if you go to the vestry, there, there is feed and um, sound and vision through there as well. You'll be able to follow us through there. So we'll see you later on. Okay, great. Thank you, David, if we could have. Who am I and where do I belong? We're going to be reflecting on identity and belonging in this part of the service. Two of the biggest questions that we as human beings will ever face in our lives are these two. Who am I? Who am I? What are the things that make up who I am? And where do I belong? Um, where do I feel at home? We're going to be thinking about that. And to help us for a moment or two, we're going to be thinking about the things that make us who we are. Here's a map of the world, obviously, different countries there. And as I look around the congregation today, I can see that we have people from different parts of the world. We were born into a particular community in a particular geographical area. When we were there, we grew up and we learned its language and we behaved according to its culture. These are things that are common to all of us across the world. One of the things about this common observation is that that divides us. We are one human race, but we are divided by language. We are one human race, but we do things differently in different parts of the world. So who am I in all of this? And to what race do I belong? I'm, I'm told that the difference between race and ethnicity is to do with race being sort of genetic and ethnicity being to do with culture, the way we do things. But as the world has shrunk because of our capacity to travel, the, the range of genetic possibilities for children uh, has, has grown astronomically. And we say, well, what race do I belong to? And we have to observe that in the world today, as in the world many years ago, many generations ago, that race also can have a tendency to divide. Where do I belong? And then we come to religion. In what religion was I raised? Now, looking back at the map of the world, if you look at the different parts of the world, the chances are that if you were born uh, in India, you may, be, may have been brought up as a Hindu or in Pakistan as a Muslim, in Israel as a, as a Jew and certainly in, in other parts of, of Europe and so on. Um, in, in, in Britain, you may have been brought up within the Christian faith if you were born here. But obviously, as communities have spread across the globe, we have pockets of different religious communities. In what religion was I raised? Why is that important? Because it impinges on who I am and my sense of belonging. And so when we come to Ruth and we ask the question, who is Ruth in all of this? She was born in a Moabite city, and therefore her language and her culture were very different to Naomi's from Bethlehem. She was a Moabitess, and she calls herself a foreigner in, in the text that we read today. And although Moabites and the Israelites had, had common ancestors a way, 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 way back, the Moabites were particularly hostile to the Israelites. And so how would people respond to her when she went to Bethlehem? And more by religion, she did not worship the God of Israel. She worshipped the God Chemosh when, when she was in Moab, divided again from the people that she was travelling towards. But when they stopped on the road to Bethlehem, and Naomi said to them, go back, it was decision time for Ruth and Orpah. And Ruth had to say to herself, not only who am I, but going on this journey, who will I be? Who will I become? 
And she said these stunning words to her mother-in-law. Don't, don't tell me to go back. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, the God of Israel, will be my God. And Ruth decided in that moment to take on a new identity and to find a new place of belonging. And she turned her back on the past and went with Naomi. But these two widows in a, in a society without any benefit system, how will they survive? And the only way that they will survive is by Ruth getting involved in the gleaning at the harvest fields. It just so happened, our narrator said, that when they arrive at Bethlehem, it was harvest time. And remember I said, the narrator tells us about this man called Boaz. I like how the Jewish Publication Society translate this little bit. Um, Ruth went out into the fields. She didn't know where she was going. She didn't know whose field it was. And as luck would have it, so-called luck, but we know there was a bigger hand behind this story. As luck would have it, she actually went into the fields of Boaz to glean. And he is a very, very important person in our story. And he is a very, very important person in Bethlehem. He was informed, you know, he knew everything that was going on around the town. He had his ear to the ground. People would tell him things because he was a big cheese in the town. And he was protective. He says to Ruth, don't go in any other fields because I know that if you do that, you'll be putting yourself in danger of sexual assault. Stay in our fields and you will be protected. And he is respectful. He says to her, but we'll see in a moment, I know who you are, I know what you have done, and I highly respect it. And he's compassionate. He says to his gleaner, he says to his harvesters, now, don't give this girl any problems at all. Leave some out of the sheaves to give to her. Leave some more drop some more intentionally so that she can go and feed her mother-in-law. And so Boaz had a heart for those who were um, poor and, and on the breadline or be below the breadline. And what he says to Ruth is quite important for us. He says, I know how much you've given up. I know how you've turned your back on your own family on your own culture, on your own town. I know how much you care for Naomi. I know that you've been working hard here from morning till night in order to feed her. I know that in coming to live among us, you have found refuge under the wings of our God, the God of Israel. Boaz is really saying to Ruth, you belong here. I can see from the way that you are acting and the way in which you have adopted our, our God, that you belong here. You are one of us. Ruth has adopted a new identity. By her commitment, by her faithful actions, Ruth found a new identity and a new place to belong. And Ruth speaks to us, you know, in this way. You know, wherever, wherever we were born, whatever our racial mix, whatever faith we began in, we can find a new identity and a new place of belonging within the people of God.
And I think Ruth speaks very forcibly to us by saying, if you take a step of faith the way I took a step of faith, and remember last week I was saying we, had, we need to remember other stories as well. This story is described very like Abraham's story of leading, leaving his family to, to go on a, a march to the promised land. By taking a step, a step of faith like mine, you can find, you too can find a new identity and a new place to belong. It seems to me that this is one of the really important aspects of who we are as Christians, of the Christian church. We are a place to believe, a place to belong, and a place to become. Ruth found that she um, could worship the God of Israel. She found a place to believe, and we too find a place to believe here. Right here was the, um, the manger for the nativity scene. We believe in a God, the God of Israel has revealed himself in Jesus Christ coming to us. We believe that he lived and died and rose again to be our Boaz, our Redeemer. We believe that this is a place to belong, that these things unite us, where race and language and ethnicity divide us. We find a place here that brings us all together. And it is a place to become. We don't just come here and that's who we are. In our interaction with one another, in our interaction with folks from other places and other cultures, we are in a state of becoming. We are becoming more like the person Jesus wants us to be. And Ruth was becoming more like a worshiper of the God of Israel. She found this new identity, this new place of belonging, and we can find that identity and belonging um, within the framework of the, the people of God, the, the, the people of Jesus, the Christian church. And it is my hope and prayer that, that we will do that. We will be like Ruth and embrace this new identity and contribute who we are so that we and others may have this sense of belonging. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for Ruth and for the way in which she gave an unstinting commitment, a compassionate commitment to Naomi. And we bless you for the way in which you honored that commitment and gave her this new identity and place of belonging. Thank you for Boaz. Thank you for someone who is deeply concerned and compassionate for those who had no food. Thank you for someone who in the end would give of himself in an act of redemption. And we pray that we would be able to imitate their faith and their actions. As we ourselves shelter under the wings of the God of Israel, the God who came to us in Jesus Christ our Lord, and in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>